Okay, so when we get to talking about point of care ultrasound, we're going to talk about doing it as well as we can, doing it efficiently, and doing all things optimally. The most important step, can you guess what the most important step in an optimal point of care ultrasound is? It's a thorough history and physical because we have to have a clinical sense for one, how do we want to start and approach the ultrasound examination? And two, how are we going to interpret the finding? So as with all of medicine, the cornerstone is going to be a thorough and well done history and physical exam. And just like we talked about before, we're going to do heart and lung point of care ultrasound, get ourselves, get ourselves some immediate answers that are going to help us make good decisions for our patients. So let's work our way through the cardiovascular questions first. And again, I usually like to start with the heart. So these are things that I'm quickly going to be able to answer at the bedside. Looking at the cardiovascular questions, it's really three questions. Is it tamponade? Is it a massive or even submassive pulmonary embolism? Or do we see signs of CHF? And let's start just with tamponade and what that's going to look like. So the patient's in front of us, they're short of breath. Tamponade's not that common, but when it's there, it's going to change the way we practice and the way we manage our patients dramatically. So we're starting with some of our non-respiratory causes, cardiovascular. Tamponade's the first thing, and the main finding is going to be pericardial effusion. Now there are other findings that are going to relate to the severity and true tamponade physiology. Again, for further details on that, and for further details on that, please review our cardiac and pulmonary point of care ultrasound lectures. But let's review some of these findings. So that's question number one from the cardiovascular perspective. Is there tamponade? Well, first thing is pericardial effusion. There has to be fluid around the heart for there to be true tamponade physiology. Now there can be other things, much less commonly pleural effusions and air that compress the right ventricle and increase right atrial pressure. But for the most part, we're talking about patients with, with tamponade. And that's going to mean there's got to be fluid around the heart. So if there's no fluid in the pericardial space, tamponade is pretty much off of our list. And this is just some examples. Fluid, circumferential, it's compressing the entire heart, not just the right ventricle, which is barely able to relax during diastole. We see the little fat pads swimming around in the pericardial fluid here. Same thing here. We see a large pericardial fusion wrapping all the way around the heart. Makes the chambers harder to recognize because everything things compressed. And again, we see this fat pad that's just floating around inside the pericardial space. So if we see this in our patient who's short of breath, immediately we're going to change our course of action into addressing this if need be immediately or making other arrangements. And just a quick note, I know I beat this to death in prior discussions, but the thing that trips people up the most is, is it a fat pad or is it an effusion? Here in this case, we see a small fat pad. You can see it's got some gray tones. It's fairly homogeneous, regularly distributed gray color. It's not super thick. Doesn't look like it goes all the way around the heart. So that's one of the biggest clues. It does not look like it goes all the way around the heart. Remember, this is the most dependent area. So fluid is preferentially gonna flow posterior to the heart if it's going to be there, assuming there's no scar tissue. This is fat. It mostly changes shape a little bit with the cardiac cycle, but it doesn't, you don't see things wiggling around and waving around inside of it. Whereas in this example here, we see fluid. It's circumferential. It wraps all the way around the heart. We can see it pinches up in front of the descending thoracic aorta, and we see lots of shape changing. We see, we get a sense that this is wiggling around in this, bo in this bag of fluid, and we see these kind of waving shape changes through throughout instead of just a slight variation in the thickness. So that's one way you can help distinguish fat pad versus effusion. Other things are look at the right ventricle, is there any effect on it or not? Look at multiple views, that's going to help you tremendously as well. So fat pad versus effusion. Now in tamponade, we normally see, especially as it's advanced, we see right ventricular collapse. So here the right ventricle is almost completely compressed. Same thing here, we see it dipping during the cardiac cycle and these are large effusions. So pretty significant and we see right ventricular collapse. Now remember, this is always, always, always correlated to what the patient looks like in front of us. So the thing I'll often ask myself is how is the right ventricle filling rather than do I see any signs of collapse? Because if you stare hard enough, sometimes it's pretty easy for your eyes to think you see some little tiny dip in the right ventricle. But ask yourself, how is it filling? If it's filling through most of diastole, then the patient's probably doing okay. Again, always correlate with how the patient looks in front of you. So again, note here, we see fluid. It wraps all the way around, pinches up in front of, 
of the descending thoracic aorta and we see these shape changes. They're not, it's a little more changing than just varying thickness. We see actually kind of fluid waving up and down around making little waves as that heart beats inside of it. And then again, it pinches up anterior to the descending thoracic aorta. So that brings us back to one of our first cases where we have a 59 year old patient admitted with pneumonia and sepsis who's still hypotensive despite being on multiple pressors and um, being hydrated with fluids and we wonder why are they just truly refractory septic or is something else going on and what's going on is this patient has cardiac tamponade from some other inflammatory pericarditis that's accompanying their pneumonia so we immediately drain this the patient's hemodynamics drastically improve and they're able to come off pressors pretty quickly so that's question number one in our cardiovascular set of questions is there tamponade if not then we move ourselves down the list to our other questions in our patient who's short of breath so question one is this a cardiovascular cause like tamponade yes or no if it's not we can move on is there signs of an obvious massive or submassive pulmonary embolism so in our decision tree we've got respiratory non-respiratory causes we've already talked about this one we're going to drop those out for now and we're going to ask ourselves is this a massive or submassive pe and things we're going to look for are things we should readily see when we do a bedside echo right ventricular dilation and then if we want to look further we can look for pleural infarcts or source clots and we'll talk a little bit about when we want to use those things but the main thing we're going to look at in our heart and lung ultrasound is dilation of the right ventricle. That's it. So that's cardiovascular question number two. Is there a massive pulmonary embolism, massive or submassive? And so we get a couple of views, right? So we see our peristernal long axis view. And again, double check ourselves that we see aortic and mitral. So and we see, we check to make sure we get the best width of the left ventricle we can get. And if we've checked those things and this still looks big, then it's probably truly big. Over here, we get, again, checking to make sure we have the best length and width on the left sided chambers, left ventricle and left atrium. And if the right ventricle still looks big in that view, then it's probably definitely big. So these are fairly obviously dilated right ventricles. And these should kind of move our brain into thinking maybe this patient that's newly short of breath or has worsening shortness of breath, maybe they've got a submassive or a massive PE. Other examples, again, we looked at one similar to this before, big right ventricle compressing the left and double checking ourselves. We see the full length of the left ventricle and atrium and we make sure we got the best width that we can get on that left ventricle so that we're not fooling ourselves with an artificial slice artifact. Same thing here, full length and width of the left sided chambers and we see a dilated right ventricle. Now here we have a dilated right atrium as well so that may suggest at least some chronicity to high right heart pressures. These are all suggestive things none of them are definitive on their own. Other findings in the short axis views we see the D sign so the dilated right ventricle makes the left look like a D. We want to just check for symmetry and that we're getting the most rounded view of the left ventricle that we can get. Um, same thing here. We have a round. We're doing the best we can to get a rounded left ventricle, but it's not round anymore because we have a dilated right and that's compressing it. So as with everything, remember there can be chronic causes of right ventricular dilation. We have to think about the whole clinical picture. And if we're thinking, okay, this patient has that's short of breath, probably has a massive PE and they're too sick for me to definitively diagnose that, um, maybe look for a source clot in an extremity in the legs or maybe the arm if there's a pick line or something there that can help lend weight to that diagnosis before you do things like push thrombolytic therapy. So this leads us to one of our other cases where the 49-year-old patient who we were about to admit to the hospital for chest pain or who we were watching for serial enzymes on the floor, they look okay at rest, but something just we wanted to take a look and see what's going on and they've got a submassive pulmonary embolism with dilation of the right ventricle and we notice when we do walk that them, they get hypoxic and they start to get pretty significantly short of breath and changes our diagnostic workup and plan significantly. And if this patient was drastically sick, we didn't have the ability to obtain a definitive diagnosis, maybe they're allergic to IV contrast, something like that, we can go look for a source clot somewhere in the extremities, obviously target that look to where it's higher risk, like the legs, or uh, maybe there's instrumentation in the arm or something like that. So that's two questions down with the cardiovascular, only one to go, signs of CHF. So again, by doing bedside echo and ultrasound, in a few minutes at the bedside, we can get some of these things on or off the list very quickly. So that's the next one, signs of CHF. We'll break that down a little bit. Maybe we've looked and we don't see a massively dilated right ventricle and we don't see signs of tamponade. So the next question while we're kind of looking at the heart and then moving to the lungs is do we see signs of congestive heart failure? And those things are going to be regular 
regularly distributed B lines. And then most commonly we're gonna see just failure, inadequate pump performance of the left ventricle. But maybe in some cases we may see other findings of mechanical heart failure, like acute regurgitation from aortic dissection or endocarditis or something like that. So that's our third question, is there CHF? So the main thing is left ventricular failure. So if we're looking at their heart and they're short of breath, and we see this left ventricle just not pumping, not performing well at all. We see very little change in the left ventricular volume or area during systole. We see poor opening of the mitral valve. Then that's a clue that maybe that's part of or contributing to their shortness of breath. One thing to be careful of is to judge the left ventricular ejection fraction. What we want to do is we want to be able to visualize the endocardium very well. If we can't if we can't visualize that well, then our judgments of the left ventricular pump action are gonna be less accurate. So short axis views, again, where we just see really poor pumping of the left ventricle. Here we see wall motion abnormalities involving the posterior and lateral sections of left ventricle. We see some decent squeeze here, but less around here. So these are just straight out left ventricular pump failure findings. In some of the apical views, again, we see that the volume change very minimally during systole, very minimal change during systole. So these are, again, cases of left ventricular failure. Just some other very obvious poorly functioning left ventricles where they're dilated and they're just not changing volume very much whatsoever. So again, be cautious because patients can have chronic left ventricular failure and still be having other things like pneumonia or COPD and have other causes that they're short of breath. So I'll look at the whole clinical picture and we're going to use lung ultrasound to help us either strengthen or diminish the likelihood that this is a true CHF patient in front of us. So as always, incorporate the entire clinical picture, including the lung ultrasound. So we've got things like heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We've got mechanical etiologies of CHF. We've got lots of other reasons people can be in congestive heart failure. So here are just a couple of other examples. So over here we can see this aortic vegetation that's causing possibly an acute mechanical etiology of congestive heart failure. There's actually mitral vegetation as well. Maybe over here we see these big vegetations or maybe there could be a papillary muscle rupture or something like that that's causing a mechanical etiology of congestive heart failure. So other findings that you should readily see if you're paying attention to your anatomy doing a reasonable bedside echocardiogram. So we looked at a couple of these findings. We looked at left ventricular failure, some of the mechanical findings, but let's talk about the lungs because we've kind of looked at the heart, right? We've looked for pericardial tamponade, uh, dilated right ventricle. We've looked for pump failure or mechanical things that may be causing congestive heart failure. And now we're going to move to the lungs. And when we look at the lungs, if we think they have heart failure, we should see regular B lines. So that's the hallmark finding in the lungs for congestive heart failure representing pulmonary edema. And what we're going to see is just B lines. They're, they should be pretty symmetric from left to right, and they're usually more concentrated at the bases and they shouldn't really skip around. They may decrease as you work your way towards the patient's head, but they should mostly be regularly distributed. So mostly all concentrated in one place. You shouldn't see you know, a couple at the base and then they're gone, but then you see some more popping up at the top of the lung. They should be mostly in the same places on both sides and they shouldn't really skip around too much. They should gradually increase or decrease as you work your way up or down the chest. And you see here, these are all coalesced together. So there's multiple bee lines here. We see a lot of bee lines here in this example as well. So regular bee lines is equivalent to pulmonary edema. And pulmonary edema means bee lines that are symmetric and usually more at the bases. Now remember there are cardiac and non-cardiac causes of pulmonary edema. Most of the time when we see it acutely, it's cardiac, but not always. And just this little cartoon kind of representing, we see less towards the head, where we, here we see no bee lines at the upper lung zones and lower down in the chest we see more bee lines. So this is classically or typically what pulmonary edema is going to look like. Of course there can always be there can always be variants of these things but most of the time this is the pattern that we're going to see. Now with acute pulmonary edema and CHF sometimes there are pleural effusions as well. Pleural effusions I like to think of them as either small where I'm not going to treat them invasively and larger to, and decide whether I'm going to treat them invasively or not. But I think it's important to point out that often congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema patients have pleural effusions as well. We ha what we have to decide is when do they
they get to the threshold of where it's a big enough problem where we want to treat them invasively. So with those things in mind, that brings us back to one of our cases where we had this 43-year-old male, previously healthy, coughing, but increasingly short of breath, not getting better, multiple healthcare visits. And we take a look at the heart and the lungs, and what we see is decreased ejection fraction, so pump failure in the left ventricle. And we see pretty symmetric B lines in the chest and a pleural fusion, a little bit on one side, maybe we see some on the other side. So this is a patient with a new onset cardiomyopathy that's causing their shortness of breath that has been difficult to diagnose over multiple visits up till now. But this is one of the examples of how bedside ultrasound can be a powerful tool to make an accurate diagnosis in a matter of two minutes before there are any other tests that come back. So just a quick review. When you have the patient in front of you who's short of breath and you want to apply ultrasound to help you make sense of what's going on with them, some of the first questions are, is there a cardiovascular cause? Could there be tamponade? So is there a pericardial effusion or not? If not, that's off the list. So that's that. Next up, is there a massive or a submassive pulmonary embolism? And with that, we're going to see generally a right ventricle. We may look for other things, a source clot. If you guys get good images of pleural infarcts, please send them to me because I don't have a good collection. So that's kind of what that's going to look like. So we see these big right ventricles, see source clot here. Now again, this does not take smaller pulmonary emboli off the table. And then lastly, do we see CHF? So most of the time, that's going to mean poor pump performance and symmetric, regularly distributed B lines in the lungs. But don't forget the other things, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and the mechanical causes can drastically change your plan. Review those, make sure you can recognize some of those as well. So that's it. That's our cardiovascular causes. So within a couple of minutes at the bedside, looking at the heart and then starting to look into the lungs, we should be able to answer, is this a cardiovascular cause of shortness of breath? And we can do all of this way quicker than it takes me to talk about it. We can do this in a couple of minutes, well before any other tests have resulted in our hospital or emergency department. Those are our cardiovascular etiology that we can pretty much exclude or immediately diagnose at the bedside with ultrasound, some of which would be hard to diagnose no matter what other tests we get and definitely time sensitive in finding some of these.